Our next speaker, Jeremy Chado, is a border breacher, basically. He always transcends between reality and fiction. By trade, he's an artistic director, a filmmaker, but he's also a performance artist. He challenges himself, thinking outside the box, we had that, dares to produce, and he will ask you, are you doing the same? Are you living in the now? Are you doing what you should be doing and what you want to be doing? And he will uh, tell you what he's thinking about that. Welcome, Jeremy. Uh, this is a mulberry. Uh, there are three kinds. There's uh, red, white, and black. Uh, the white mulberry originates in central China, the black in uh, Iran, Afghanistan, and northern India, and the red, like this one, on the east coast and midwest of North America. I grew up with this tree. This, this is the tree of my youth. Uh, they completely covered my neighborhood. My best friend, Boo, uh, had one in his grandmother's backyard. And Boo and I spent a lot of time there over the years climbing that tree, eating the fruits. And every night I would come home, these big black splotches all over my clothes to the total consternation of my mom. Right? They had dark stains and a purple tongue. Now, a couple of years ago, I was in Lisbon, Portugal, um, researching the screenplay for a feature film about Angolans who live in the city. And every night on my way home, after interviewing all these different kinds of people, I would walk by this enormous mulberry tree. And I could not for the life of me figure out where it came from. I thought, Maybe it came with the Romans, maybe the Arabs, the, the English during one of the many occupations of the city, or maybe the Portuguese uh, came across it uh, during hundreds of years of sea travel and uh, exploration and brought it back themselves and planted it there. I don't know. Um, but that's not the, the story that I want to tell you. Uh, the story that I want to tell you um, is about the time that I was in Lisbon, uh, and I was interviewing all of these people, probably 50, 60 people in total. Uh, there was only one interview that I didn't film, and it was probably my favorite interview. Um, it was with a, uh, a very famous Angolan author who lives part of the time in Lisbon, part of the time in Luanda, Angola, and part of the time in Brazil, a guy named José Eduardo Agualuza. Now, Agualuza, he told me this story. And I am going to do my very best to try to relate it to you, okay? Uh, in Angola, uh, everyone's issued an identity card. And it looks a little bit like a US driver's license. And on the bottom, in, in, in the corner, there's this little spot that designates your race. And in Angola, there are only three races. You are either black, white, or mixed. That's it. And the way they decide on this is quite scientific. Um, you uh, fill out an application form, you take it down to the office that issues the identity cards, and you give it to the woman sitting behind the desk, and she reads through it, and then she looks up at you. <laughs> and whatever she decides you are in that moment, that's your race. Forever. So, Agulusa fills out his uh, application form, he takes it down to the office, gives it to the woman sitting behind the desk, and she reads through it and then looks up at him, and in less than half a second says he's white, writes it down, issues him his card. So, apparently, Agulusa's wife uh, caused a bit of confusion in the office. Uh, I never met her, uh, but according to Agulusa, she has very dark skin and, quote, fine Caucasian features, whatever that means. So, she fills out her application form, and she takes it down to the office and gives it to the woman sitting behind the desk who reads through and then looks up at her and says that she, you, you, no? Um, she, she calls a couple of her colleagues over, and they all kind of get together, and they, they look at her like, here, turn, turn, turn to your left, right? And they turn, turn to your right, right? They, they see the top of your head, and they say, you know, and after quite a bit of deliberation, they come up with, um, uh, to a consensus. Now, I, I don't know what they uh, decided, but that's not the story I want to tell you. The story I want to tell you is about her friend. See, 
Agualuza's wife had this friend in Luanda, this beautiful, brilliant, talented woman who got this offer, this offer to go study in the United States, in the state of Louisiana, in the town of New Orleans, in a very famous college, very famous university called Tulane. And so she took this offer and flew off to Tulane, and she started studying. And when she was there, she met a man. And she fell head over heels in love with this man. And as fate would have it, this man fell head over heels in love with her. It was like a fairy tale. Right? He's a young African-American man, quite light-skinned. Uh, you know, in New Orleans, unlike Angola, they, they have something like... Uh, you know, 45 or 50 different racial designations. You know, I mean, historically, they're totally obsessed by it. So back in the day, he would have been called an Octoroon or Quadroon or Mustafino, or, I mean, name it. But today, he's African-American, and quite proudly so. I mean, he's a bit of a black nationalist, doesn't really like white people, um, um, believes deeply in Marcus Garvey's rallying cry of back to Africa, and loves jazz music because it is, as Nina Simone said, black classical music and tells the story of black people in America. So, they fall in love, they get married, and she studies. And upon finishing her studies, she gets this telephone call from Luanda this, with this amazing job offer. Like, um, and, and, and so she goes to her new husband and is like, um, uh, honey, uh, what, what would you think about you know, moving back with me to Luanda, Angola, go, going back to Africa? He is ecstatic. I mean, this, this is a dream come true. I mean, not, not only does he have a, a beautiful, talented, intelligent, loving African wife, he is now going to fulfill a childhood dream and actually move back to Africa. So they pack up all the things and they send it off and then they hop in a plane and they fly after it. And when they arrive, she goes off to work and he goes and fills out his application form and takes it down to the office that uh, issues the identity cards and he gives it to the woman sitting behind the desk and she reads through it and looks, looks up at him and in less than half a second says he's white and writes it down. <laughs> His, his Portuguese is not so good at this point, but he's pretty clear he understood what she said. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> what he did. I mean, here, 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 and he calls a couple of her colleagues over here. Like, look, look, look at my left side. Here, look, look at my right side. Here, look at the top of my head. It's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's unanimous. That's a white guy. <laughs> and they issue him his card. And stunned, he slowly makes his way back home to start his life in Africa. And to add insult to injury, in Luanda, apparently nobody likes jazz music except white people. So not only is he white, but all of his friends are white. And he starts to resent all these black people telling him what to do all the time. And so here you have the story of a young African-American man who finally fulfills a childhood dream of moving back to Africa only to become a white man. Now, I love this story. <laughs> uh, it is, it's funny, it's allegorical, and in many ways, it is emblematic of the challenges of being an American from the United States, trying to deal with the world out there while being afflicted by our national ailment, a collective amnesia from which I believe we all suffer. In my opinion, we are a deeply dehistoricized people, meaning we don't really know who we are or where we're from, or not how it relates to the world out there, and it causes all kinds of problems. You see, Agualuza's story spoke to me personally. Um, in, in, in a humorous way, uh, it revealed a deep truth about a fundamental bind that I at least find myself in. So, I grew up in the city of Detroit. And I was the only white kid in my neighborhood when I grew up. Although I'm not sure I realized that at the time. Um, I, you know, I mean, all of us believed the black was beautiful, and all of us, including me, deeply believed in Marcus Garvey's rallying cry back to Africa. Not, although none of us really had any idea where like, Africa actually was, because Africa wasn't like a place you could travel to physically. It, it was, uh, for us, it was, um, it was a sentiment, uh, mythology. You know, it was a repository of longing. 
longing for a just world, longing for a sense of rootedness that would bring us back to ourselves and give us self-knowledge. Africa was a reversal of collective trauma. Africa was the place that would set the world right and reestablish order in the universe. Now, when I was back in Lisbon and I was interviewing all of these people, at some point in the middle of every single one of the interviews, the person would stop me and be like, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. What is a white guy from Detroit doing making a movie in Lisbon about Portuguese and Angolans? Um, it's a good question. Uh, and there's an answer. Now, it's a, it's a little bit difficult to, to articulate, but there is a direct, albeit somewhat circuitous, link between Detroit, Michigan and Lisbon, Portugal. The transatlantic slave trade. And any narrative about this particular slave trade begins with a very famous triangle linking Europe, the Americas, and Africa. Now, think about it like this, right? Okay, the year is 1325, and Manza Musa, the king of Mali, he uh, makes this pilgrimage to, um, to Mecca with 500 slaves, 100 camels, each carrying loads of gold. Now, this just happens to be the period of time that we refer to as the Crusades, in which people from all over Europe are using this extended historical event as an excuse to travel, see the world. I mean, today we call them Crusaders, but in fact, they were just, you know, they're like, people. They were like bakers, farmers, craftspeople, stuff like that, right? So now imagine a group of Portuguese crusaders who just happen to be in Mecca on this particular day, and they see this black king and his gold, and word travels back to the kingdom of Portugal, there's gold in Africa. Now, a hundred years later, in 1433, a ship sets sail from the port of Lisbon in search of this mythical gold, and it's carrying copper cloth, wine, and tools, and it makes its way down the west coast of Africa until it arrives to the mines of Arkan, where they do indeed trade these goods for gold. Word spreads, and trading posts open all up and down the coast of Africa, and more and more ships make the voyage from Lisbon. The Portuguese trade goods for gold until they realize they can make more gold if they capture the Africans and sell them to Muslim merchants who need porters to carry their goods through the treacherous trade routes of the Saharan Desert. They they needed slaves because they were expendable. It didn't matter if they died. They did die in the Portuguese corner of the market early on this expendable labor. Now, uh, remember that, that group of guys, the, uh, um, uh, the Portuguese crusaders who just happened to be in Mecca on that particular day, and they see Manza Musa, the king of Mali, with 500 slaves, 100 camels, each carrying loads of gold? Well, they were lost. Uh, they, you know, they were on their way home from the Holy Lands, and they made a left, and they should have made a right, and it was like, whoa, they come across this caravan selling sweet salt, or what you and I would call sugar. The Arabs had learned how to cultivate sugarcane from the Indians, and they turned into this mass business, right? So the Portuguese crusaders uh, bought sugarcane from the Muslim merchants, and they traveled with it back to Venice. Uh, Lisbon and the Atlantic Sea Islands of Madeira, uh, the Canary Islands, and Capo Verde, at which point the Portuguese stopped selling Africans to the Muslim merchants and started using them as labor in their own sugar production, and boom! Europe's insatiable desire for sugar is born. In 1492, Christopher Columbus falls in love with the governess of the Canary Islands, and upon parting as a token of her affection, she offers him cuttings of sugarcane, which she carries with him to the New World, introducing sugar production for the first time in the Caribbean, and it spreads like wildfire. It requires this mass labor force, this big business. Everyone gets involved. In 1651, port of Amsterdam, Captain Philip van der Goss raises the sail of his trusty ship, the Caritas, and heads down to the port town of Luanda, what's now known as Angola. There he collects 309 men, women, and children, he makes a two-month voyage across the sea until uh, they arrived to, by the time they arrived to their first destination in British Barbados, only 181 of the original 309 have survived. The rest have died en route of an intestinal disease called the Bloody Flux and were thrown overboard. The remaining men, women, and children were sold in British Barbados, Dutch Antilles, French uh, Santa Domingue, now known as Haiti, uh, Spanish Puerto Rico, before heading up to New Amsterdam, now known as New York, where the final Angolan slaves are sold before filling back up with raw materials and heading back to Amsterdam. Now, meanwhile, those original New York Angolan slaves, their descendants will eventually join the homesteaders moving west in 1825 until they arrive to the French fur trading town of Detroit de la Querie, now known as Detroit, where their descendants by the 20th century will get jobs in Henry Ford's auto factory and move to my neighborhood. Or, uh, let's go back to this little island. 
uh, Saint-Domingue, uh, that are uh, now known as Haiti. The slaves here will continue working in the sugar plantations until 1791 when there's this famous slave revolt. And in the ensuing mayhem, a small group will somehow manage to escape. And they arrive to the French colony of uh, Louisiana, the town of New Orleans where they will be captured and sold upriver to a famous cotton plantation on the outskirts of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, called Angola. Many years later, after the abolition of slavery, their descendants will join what's known as the Great Migration to the Industrialized North and eventually arrive to the industrialized town of Detroit, where they will get jobs in Henry Ford's auto factory and move to my neighborhood. Or how about this? <laughs> eh? 1651, port of Lisbon. Captain Antonio Fons prepares his ship, the Salvador do Mundo, to pick up a special shipment of slaves from uh, Bengala in what is now known as Angola to be delivered directly to the Caribbean sea island of uh, Hispaniola, now known as the Dominican Republic. En route, the Salvador de Mundo is attacked by a rogue British slave ship called the Pineapple. Its cargo stolen, Captain James Maddox will deliver the slaves directly to Jamestown, Virginia, where they will be sold on the auction block, branded, and set to work in the tobacco plantation. They will continue to work in the tobacco plantation until 1793, when Eli Whitney patents the cotton gin, at which point they'll be sold downriver to a famous cotton plantation on the outskirts of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, called Angola. Many years later, after the abolition of slavery, their descendants will join the Great Migration to the industrialized North, uh, fleeing a perfect storm of racism, lynching, hurricanes, and the demise of the cotton industry by a little tiny insect called the Boll Weevil. They will eventually join with their friends in Detroit, get jobs in Henry Ford's auto factory, and move to my neighborhood. Or finally, in 1865, at the end of the American Civil War, slavery is officially abolished in the United States of America, and all of our Angolan slaves and their descendants are suddenly free, 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 free. And then six months later, the black codes are passed, including the Vagrancy Act, which states that if you're black and you don't have proof of uh, residence or employment, you're breaking the law and uh, arrested and thrown into jail. Now, none of the former slaves had a, a job contract or a lease, which they could only get from the former slave master, so they're all rounded up and thrown into jail. The Angola plantation just becomes the Angola Penitentiary, and all the former slaves are thrown back into the old slave quarters. Now, some of them farm in uh, various external farms, but the vast majority continue to farm right there in the Angola Penitentiary, which to this day, April 5th, 2014, is referred to as The Farm, where they grow soybean, wheat, and corn, or manufacture sweatshirts like this one that I bought online for 20 bucks. 50% cotton, 50% polyester. It was made in Honduras and printed in Angola, Louisiana. One balmy night in 1928 on the outskirts of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, a young man, descendant of a former slave, is walking home from a wedding with his wife and their little four-year-old boy asleep in his arms. And on the way, they're stopped by a police officer who asks for his identification. So he reaches into his pockets to provide proof of employment and residence. Only to realize that he left his wallet back in a jacket he lent to his brother at the wedding. And then he's immediately arrested, taken to the Angola prison, and is set to work on the farm for the next 24 years until 1952 when he, with 31 other men, will take simple gardening tools and slice through their own Achilles tendons in protest of brutality and hard labor. This group of 32 men will come to be known as the Heel String Gang. Now, that little four year old boy by this point is a young man and seeing no future for himself in the south he and his sister will travel to the north in what is known as the second great migration to join with family and get jobs in the auto industry and in 1967 he will arrive to detroit and at the height of the civil rights movement he will be embroiled in the race rebellions which set the whole city on fire and in the aftermath of that mayhem he will move with his family to the neighborhood that me and my family moved to a couple years later. And his children will start to have children. And one of them is a little boy that everyone calls Boo, who will become my best friend. The one who I grew up with eating mulberries in his grandmother's mulberry tree. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Jeremy.